Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we're going to be examining the mosaic of meanings, messages and methods that Blake uses across his incredibly short but punchy poem, The Sick Rose. So the central image in the title is incredibly relevant to the meaning in this poem. The image of the rose, which we today associate with love. And I suspect that very obvious image illusion leads us onto the question we should be asking. What is Blake suggesting to us about love? Let's get a bit more specific about the image of the rose. It harks back to significance within medieval literature, where it's linked as a flower to virginity, specifically to the chastity of a young woman, specifically a woman who's about to blossom into sexual being, so her innocence is what comes from the rose in this form. Today it's popularised as an image of romantic love and passion, and this was definitely the case in Blake's day, though not so much for selling flowers on Valentine's Day. As a flower, the rose demonstrates the transient fleeting nature of human life. Where it blooms, it smells sweet, but undeniably has a death that's imminent no sooner than it blooms. But the focus is not of the rose's lifespan, but of the fact that this rose is sick. The adjective sick draws our attention to the focus of our poem, that this rose is suffering. And to cut to the chase, it is the fault of a worm, specifically a canker worm, that is to blame. Because the worm is so small, it can, well, infiltrate and penetrate the rose and corrupt it, ruin its innocence. So the worm is a culprit, but it's also something we need to unpack for its significance. Its associations with death and decay run through literary history. Specifically, in medieval times, it was used interchangeably with a serpent, which we obviously know to have biblical connotations with the fall of mankind. After all, Eve in Genesis 3 is seduced by a serpent. And sexuality and shame abound in that episode because it's when Adam and Eve suffer at the hands of the serpent and they are taken away uh, from the goodness of Eden, they realise they are naked and they hide from God. The invisibility and scale of this worm being so small mirrors what Christians could assert as the devil lurking unseen and being a master of disguise, corrupting all the small vulnerabilities that we don't acknowledge in our day-to-day -day lives. And perhaps this is a cheap shot, but it's obvious to me that this image of a canker worm is a phallic image. And by that, you know, it gives us an immense sense of, well, it mirrors the genitals in some way. But it's also important at this point to note Blake's opinions on sexual pleasure. Many people misquote him and quote him as advocating free love. I would urge you to consider the fact that Blake's Christian faith allowed him to have quite a narrow view of the sexual experience. And he believed that after the fall of humankind, with Adam and Eve being taken out of Eden, Eden even, sexual pleasure was reduced from whole body fulfilment to simply being about genitals. And so shame very much lives in the heart of this poem. I'd love for you to share your views below. I'd love you to extol what your opinion is of the significance of this poem, if it has any overarching opinions for us today. And more than anything, I would really like to encourage you to like and subscribe this channel. So let's get into it. Oh Rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night, in the howling storm, has found out thy bed of crimson joy and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Structurally, this poem is composed of two four-line stanzas, which are called quatrains. 
and each quatrain has a rhyme scheme of A, B, C, B. And even as I state that rhyme scheme, you get a sense of an ominous mood. We get short two-beat lines that heighten the sense of impending doom. And it definitely matches the poetic voice, which seems blunt and direct in its approach to the rose or rose. For instance, in our opening line, the poetic voice directly speaks to the rose and says, you're sick. The personification of rose heightens that this flower is a metaphor for a woman. The exclamation mark at the end of that first line fuels the concern of the poetic voice at this mystery illness. And then by line two, we're told that the invisible worm, with emphasis on invisible, that adjective emphasising the evil and sin of this worm acting like the devil in hidden spaces and unseen spaces. It flies in the night, we're told, in line three, with connotations of the night as where evil resides, where spirits act in the interest of the devil. And if you like, when we are at our most vulnerable, our fears and fantasies, they get in the way. And it's the darkness without the light that is obviously the night. And as if that weren't evocative enough, we're shown in line four, the howling storm, which seems to fuel the pathetic fallacy that we understand with the notion that this is frightening, passionate, tumultuous, dangerous. And at this point, there is no closure. There's a fracture between stanza one and stanza two. We do not get a full stop. And I think visually, this acknowledges the brokenness of this situation, of this love, this relationship. If we could even dare to call it love, it seems so dark and ominous. By line five, we're told that the sin has been exposed. It's been found out. And this echoes Psalm 90, verse eight, where it references secret sins in the light of thy countenance, which is essentially saying God keeps a track of every single sin you've ever made. And then there's something so graphic about understanding that this sin has been found in your bed, because there are loaded connotations with the bed. Yes, the rose itself lives on a flower bed, that's its natural home. But then when we're thinking of sin and we're thinking of a bed and we're thinking of a rose that's been attacked by a worm, we've also got, if this is a metaphor for a woman, the idea of the lover's bed. There's a clear parallel being made. The rose is sick, so the love must be sick. And what's fascinating is the use of direct address at the start of this poem accentuates the notion that, well... An actual rose would know nothing of their illness if they had been attacked by a canker rose. So maybe the rose as a human does not know how unhealthy their love is. And it links back to this notion of the invisible being told somehow. The idea that this rose is innocent enough to not know that they've been polluted is something that resides in the heart of this poem. In line six, we're told of the crimson joy. And crimson as a colour is so fueling for us. It has so many connotations that I'll just share with you. But it's definitely a colour reference in the Old Testament as the colour of sin. It's associated with blood, with shame, with sexual pleasure. It could even be seen as, well, the joy that's been infected is crimson joy. Secrecy and shame are mingled and sin has, you know, attacked the core of this person or this rose. But, you know, some have referenced critically that Crimson Joy could also be, very graphically, I dare I say it, um, the blood shed at the loss of one's virginity. 
If that weren't enough, and that weren't enough distress for us, we're told in the penultimate line, his dark secret love. So there's something sinister and covert about this love that the worm gives the rose. It seems dangerous. And then to finish this poem with so much trauma that we can't forget it and lack closure, we're told, and it's your life it destroys. There's violence in the verb destroy. And the traumatic use of a semantic field of sin and dark imagery that I've referenced across both these stanzas is what does not make this feel like a love poem. I urge you to consider the other poems that we've unpacked how does this match the oppression explored in them? What's Blake saying? Is this poem really meant to be repressed sexuality being shared? Or is it about experience that's violating? Undeniably, Blake is critiquing how society pollutes love and how shame is at the heart of that. But it's the sense that secrecy is part of the infection, corruption entering into the night and ruining something as beautiful as a rose. If I fuel to the fire the idea that Blake was this advocate in many misguided terms of free love, I wonder how that alters your picture of this poem. Love is depicted as tainted, as controlled, as dark, as secret, as even one-sided? Is the rose a victim who's infected by a villain? There's no doubt that passion is referenced, but to what extent is this consensual? Is this sin overwhelmingly well, vapid for the worm. Are they just going to move on to another one? Central themes for this poem are certainly love, the notion of falling from grace, passion, physical passion at that, and sin. But for us to make sense of it today is for us to take steps back from our own world view on all things physical and all things love and to step into a romantic gaze and consider what the power of the beautiful image of the rose is to one such as Blake with all of nature at the heart of his world view. When it's polluted by the worm, what does that say about love? Comment down below with what you think and let me know what exactly Blake meant in your mind. Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical.